Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here tonight and uh, for being at this uh, lecture performance. So uh, just to give, I'm Laura Caparrotti, if someone doesn't know me, uh, and I am the head of the Cairo Italy Theater, the Italian theater company in New York in residence here at New York University, at Casa Italiana. So what, one of the things that we do from time to time is to, um, uh, to show you something that is, in, no, I don't want to say in progress, but it's some ideas that we have so we can uh, you know, share with you these ideas and, and also see, it's like this is the first time we are doing it, so let's see how, what, what it works, what it doesn't work, or how it's going to work later on. And one of the things that I am doing lately after the pandemic, what I've decided to do is uh, to focus on several things. And one is the work of women. Uh, there are many women, Italian women, not only Italian women, but there are many Italian women, you know, we're Italian theater company, that are unknown or little known. It's not the case of tonight's uh, uh, character who is uh, uh, Adelaide Ristori has been known, um, but not the way she really is, uh, uh, what everything she did. Um, and so, are you okay? So good? No, it's okay. If, if I can help from here. Uh, and so one of the things that we have shows, as you know, with the worth of women, Moderata Fonte, we have uh, a show on Elena Cornaro Piscopia, that actually we are bringing back at the end of this year. Um, but uh, one of the idea is to do this uh, lecture performance, to be able to go universities, to go schools, and, and, and to go and tell them about this wonderful um, celebrities, these wonderful women uh, of Italian history. So tonight is the first time we are doing this, this kind of module where we, you know, we have a performance, we have some performance and we have also kind of a lecture because you will have the, the slides and you'll see some stuff. Everything that we're doing, and we also have, you know, by chance I, I've been following uh, everything that is about the library story and uh, I met Alessandra Vannucci, in, uh, who is going to be after us, talking about a specific theme on uh, Adelaide Ristori. And, and she was in, in Rome, she they gave a lecture in Rome, and, we, uh, and she told me, I'm going to be in New York. I was like, perfect, come and talk to us. So um, the, this first part is mostly on, uh, is, is really, um, uh, from her, from uh, Adelaide, because she wrote a memoir, you'll see, I'm not going to say much, I'll tell you more later on, especially also about the project, if I remember. If I don't remember, you ask, Laura, you told us, so then I can remember. Um, uh, it's really her memoir, so what she wrote, and something, uh, that I put here and there, but it's mostly her. Uh, and her life was so incredible that it's not easy to sum it up in, you know, 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then we'll go to Brazil and then we'll, we'll talk more. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I think, uh, uh, come, uh, as Dario Fo used to say, andiamo a incominciare. which uh, compares human life to a journey seems to have been invented for me. My life has glided through continuous long journeys in many countries, 
and it has been my privilege to perform the leading roles in many mortal works. I have observed that expression of human passion excites intense sensations in every race and culture. I may also add that in the vocation I have chosen, I have exercised my artistic conscience often by overtaxing my physical strength, endeavoring always to enter into the nature of the character I had to represent by studying the costumes of the times and by making historical researches. This I did in order to represent the physical and moral personalities of my characters, whose manifestations were gentle, at times, at times terrible, but always great. <laughs> the applause with which the most selected audiences honored me was certainly an adequate return for my sincere efforts. Many times I left the stage overcome by fatigue and emotion, but always happy in my success, for I adore my art. Thinking perhaps that I may not be unprofitable to those interested in this art to follow the daily struggle of an artist with the part to which she had to play, I have resolved to give a faithful account of mine without minimizing either its enthusiasm or its disillusions, its joys and its sorrow. I shall mention, day by day, the principal episodes of my artistic career, being grateful for the kind receptions I have always met, receptions which have constantly upheld me and to which I owe the perseverance and the courage that have led me to success. Adelaide Ristori was born in Cividale del Friuli on the 30th of January 1822, the daughter of strolling players. The name Ristori appears among the Comici dell'arte families in the 17th and 18th centuries. Teresa, Teresa Canossa, married to Ristori, was a modest actress who gave birth to Antonio, another modest actor, who married actress Maddalena Ricci Pometelli. They were the proud parents of a child called Adelaide. Mio padre e mia madre erano due modesti attori, drammatici, e io naturalmente dovevo essere dedicata all'arte loro. E come se fosse stato decretato dal cielo che proprio tale dovesse essere il mio destino, sembrò che i miei parenti mi volessero fare sperimentare le emozioni della scena fin dal mio nascere. Non avevo ancora tre mesi di vita quando una sera, occorrendo un bambino in fasce per la rappresentazione di una piccola farsa intitolata I regali del Capodanno, il capo comico, approfittando della buona occasione che gli procurava una neonata in compagnia, mi fece fare il mio primo debutto, col consenso di mia madre. A 12 anni ero scritturata con il famoso attore Giuseppe Moncalvo per le parti di bambina, Poco dopo, grazie a una statura slanciata, mi camuffarono da donnina, destinandomi le particine da servetta. Giunta a 13 anni, essendo io sviluppata nella persona, mi assegnarono anche qualche parte da seconda donna. Vera mostruosità, ma ciò non si bada nelle piccole compagnie. A 14 anni dovette recitare parti di prima donna giovane o di prima donna a vicenda con una provetta attrice e fu allora che recitai per la prima volta la Francesca da Rimini di Silvio Pellico nella città di Novara. E per essere così giovanetta l'esito fu tale che subito dopo mi vennero fatte offerte importanti per assumere a 15 anni le parti assolute di prima donna, con un monumento vantaggiosissimo. Il mio ottimo padre non si fece sedurre da tali offerte e preferì per me dei ruoli più modesti, d'ingenua, offertami dalla compagnia reale al servizio del re di Sardegna, che si recava parecchi mesi l'anno a Torino. La mia scrittura per la parte di Ingenua doveva durare solamente tre anni, ma dopo il primo 
Mi passarono a fare le parti di prima donna giovane e nel terzo... Le primarie, assolute. In that company she became the favorite of the leading actress of the troupe, Carlotta Marchionni, from whom she received the priceless instructions. She was 18 when, for the first time, she played Maria Stuarta in an Italian version of the Schiller's Play. When Marchioni retired in 1842, Adelaide Ristori succeeded her in the position of absolute first actress. One night, while playing Maria Stuarta del Teatro Valle, she met the Marchese Giuliano Capranica del Grillo, whose family used to own the same theater. Giunse l'età, il cui cuore provò l'impetuoso bisogno di altri affetti, che non fossero quelli dell'arte. Il trasporto che nutrivo per i fanciulli in generale non era solo innato, ma straordinario in me, sembrandomi che essi soli fossero destinati a realizzare la felicità in terra. Però non sapevo decidermi sul matrimonio, nella tema che questo potesse nuocere alla mia carriera, della quale ero impatuata. Ma la sorte mi aveva destinato a un compagno un'anima gentile, che dividendo me il culto per le arti belle, lungi dal trattenere il mio slancio, lo eccitava, stimolandomi a proseguire con tenacità nella mia vita. The Capranica family was the one of the oldest Roman families. In the 15th century, the cardinals Domenico, Angelo and Paolo played a leading role in the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Domenico linked his name to the oldest theological college of Rome, the Almo Collegio Capranica. His brother Angelo expanded the family palace which is overlooking the current Piazza Capranica near the Parlamento. And Paolo was Archbishop of Benevento. In the second half of the 17th century, Pompeo Capranica opened the, one of the first public theaters in Rome, the Teatro Capranica which is now closed. Mm -hmm. In 1727, Camillo Capranica, son of Federico, opened the Teatro Valle, which is now closed, but is open, is going to reopen in 2025. Adelaida and Giuliano married in 1846, despite the violent opposition of his noble family, who asked her to retire from the stage forever! A Torino, nell'epoca accennata sul principio di queste memorie, decisi improvvisamente di ritirarmi dalle scene, sembrandomi che l'entrare nella quiete della vita domestica dovesse farmi realizzare il mio più bel sogno. Ma questi progetti miei furono di breve durata, che il sacro fuoco dell'arte fosse stato soltanto assopito in me. Lo provai in poi percorrendo per più volte i due mondi. After a short retirement, she returned to the stage with the excuse of helping the dear friend impresario Pinsenti avoid prison because of bankruptcy. When she appeared at a benefit and was acclaimed such enthusiasm, even her husband's family agreed for her to go back to acting, especially because her husband's family didn't have money anymore. Her appearance occurred in Rome in 1849 during the siege, but it was not on until the following year that she started again acting. Her first attempt at tragedy, in which she was going to discover her great genius, was made around this time with the role of Mirra. Un'idea mi preoccupava incessantemente, rivendicare all'estero il nostro valore artistico, mostrando che anche in ciò la nostra non era una terra dei morti. Come in un baleno scatuì l'ardito progetto di andare in Francia. Disgraziatamente l'esperimento fatto nel 1830 dall'altra compagnia italiana non era davvero incoraggiante, ma potevo attribuirne l'insuccesso agli avvenimenti terribili che si verificarono a luglio e alla fuga della loro protettrice, la duchessa du Barry, che seguì nell'esilio Carlo X. <coughs> Si pensò di dare Mirra di Alfieri in Francia, senza però farla precedere per mancanza di tempo da quelle speciali pubblicità che eccitano la curiosità del pubblico d'ogni paese. 
Nulla meno il teatro era più affollato delle sere precedenti e tutta la stampa assistette alla rappresentazione. Questa tragedia di puro e severo stile italiano mi offriva il campo di mostrare quale, quale um, fosse il mio sentimento artistico, lo studio profondo psicologico che avevo fatto di quella parte, come la nostra scuola italiana sapesse accoppiare alla plasticità greca la naturale spontaneità del porgere. L'esito di questa recita sorpassò ogni nostra aspettativa. Dopo il quarto atto l'intero pubblico sembrava delirante, il foyer della scena fu invaso da celebri letterati e artisti, Alexandre Humé baciava il mio manto e le mie mani. Al quinto atto della famosissima scena fra Mirro e Ciniro, suo padre, il pubblico non cessava di applaudire, dal prorompere in esclamazione di ammirazione. At the time, there was one big actress in Paris, Rachel Elisabeth Philippe, better known as Rachel or Mademoiselle Rachel. The actress uh, Rachel was celebrated for her unmatched talent. Born in 1821, just one year before Adelaide, by the time she was 20, she achieved fame and fortune, becoming a member of the prestigious Comédie Française. Renowned for her unconventional personal life, she had many lovers. She was brilliant on stage. While the newspaper wanted uh, Raquel and Adelaide and having a quarrel, There was really never a fight between them. They never met. Adelaide went to see Rachel, and Rachel went to see Adelaide. But they look at each other from far away. At the end of a first run of shows in Paris, Adelaide was asked to stay and perform in French. But she didn't want to give up her own language. And as an excuse, she said that it was going to be very difficult to acquire a perfect diction in French. Alla fine del mio soggiorno a Parigi, ricevetti moltissime proposte di consacrarmi intieramente al, al teatro francese. Ma niente sarebbe riuscito a farmi rinunciare a recitare in italiano. Opponevo sempre il più costante rifiuto, allegando a pretesto la grandissima difficoltà di acquisire la purezza della lingua, la perfezione dell'accento francese. The minister Fold insisted with an offer from the Emperor of Spain for one year, a school for French language and diction, to then take the place of Rachel, who was going to leave the Comedy Francaise. Con mio grande rincrescimento, lasciai Parigi, dove avevo avuto la sorte di conoscere la Martin, Giorgio Sen, Théodophile Gautier, Alexandre Dumas e tanti altri, che sarebbe troppo lungo rammentare. Then she went to Belgium, the north of France, Dresda, Berlin. She was applauded everywhere. After a short visit to Italy, where she had the, to honor the contract she had with the regal company Sarda, la compagnia regale di Sardegna, on February 14, 1856, she was in Vienna with her company, performing Mirra and Mary Stuart. In April, she was back to Paris and then London. On June 4th, she opened the Lyceum with Medea. Il pubblico, pubblico inglese mi accolse con immensa simpatia, facendomi segno alle più lusinghiere dimostrazioni di affetto e di stima. Several of the most distinguished Englishmen of letters reproached me for not having in my repertoire Macbeth the masterpiece of the immortal Shakespeare. Adduceva ragione di ciò che da una compagnia straniera, Girovaga, non potevano rappresentarsi tali lavori per difetto di scenari e del numero di artisti indispensabili per tal genere di spettacoli. They replied that in England, by making cuts, they adapted production, not only to the capacity and number of actors, but also to the taste of the audience. Io falcidiare Shakespeare Commettere tale sacrilegio? Impossibile! Noi italiani non oseremo mai di mutilare le opere dei nostri classici. Pensate un po' se io verrei a mutilare le opere del vostro grande genio. Then they proposed to take on this task themselves. And in fact, 
on her return to London. In June 1857, again, 1857, at the Covent Garden Theatre, she played Macbeth, shortened, adapted for the company by Mr. Clark, and translated into beautiful Italian verses by Giulio Carcaro. The renowned Mr. Harris staged according to English tradition. Rappresentare la parte di Lady Macbeth, che divenne poi una delle mie predilette, mi preoccupava grandemente. Fosi tutta l'arte il sapere a sviscerare, rivelare e trasmettere le più minute intenzioni dell'autore. E parve agli inglesi che fossi così realmente incarnata in quel tipo perfido, scaltro, ma pur grande, da sorpassare la loro aspettativa. The drama had to be repeated for several lyrics, producing a profound impression of the soul of the audience, especially in the great sleepwalking scene. I invested myself so much in that situation that for the entire duration of the scene, my pupil remained motionless in the orbit, as to make me cry. Debbo anzi a quella forzata immobilità al principio dell'indebolimento della mia vista. In 1857 Adelaide was in Madrid, Spain, playing in Spanish to an enthusiastic audience, but she was not just playing. If Adelaide was here, it was only playing, she was doing something else. Due persone chiedono di parlarmi. Esse espongono a mio marito il, me il motivo che le conduceva. Si trattava di quel disgraziato di Ciapado che volevano salvare. Mio marito, commosso, venne a me senza preamboli e mi disse «Sai che un uomo è condannato a morte e domani deve essere fucilato?» «Lo so». «Ebbene, dicono che la sua vita è nelle tue mani e che se lo vuoi la, tua, la sua grazia è fatta. Il soldato infelice è un ottimo giovine». In suo favore parla una condotta irreprensibile da lui tenuta durante 11 anni di servizio militare. È vittima di un impeto di collera perché il sorgente che lo odiava lo percosse ingiustamente alla presenza dei suoi compagni. Ciapado non fece che mettere la mano sull'impugnatura della spada e ciò bastò perché fosse condannato a morte. La vita di quell'uomo dipende dalla regina e pare che essa vi ami. Se tu, tu le chiedi la grazia, lei te la darà. Non potevo proferire parola. Qual era l'orgasmo da cui ero invasa, pure promisi, di tentare la prova. Dopo il primo atto la regina mi accordò, accordò l'udienza richiesta. Accompagnato da uno dei miei impresari, il signor Barbieri, distinto maestro di musica, salì sul palco reale. Fui pregata di attendere per pochi minuti nella sagua, sala attigua al palco della sovrana. Tosto fu introdotto la sua presenza. La buona regina mi chiese scusa di avermi fatto aspettare. Tutti i ministri la circondavano. Mi gettai alle sue ginocchia e le presi le mani che mi aveva porte e gridai «Maestà, grazia per Ciapado!» Si commuova alle nostre preghiere. Egli ha mancato, è vero, ma per un istante si degni di giudicare benignamente questo infelice spinto a reagire dal sanguinoso insulto che ingiustamente seguì alla presenza dei suoi compagni. Accordi la vita ad un suddito devoto, valoroso, pronto a spargere il suo sangue per la propria sovrana. Se i miei poveri meriti ebbero la sorte di cattivarmi la simpatia della maestà vostra, mi conceda la grazia che a mani forte vi, vi chiedo. The queen agreed to spare the poor man, but Adelaide didn't give up. She came back with another request to shorten the sentence to six years old uh, only. Mm -hmm. The queen agreed again. And Adelaide asked for her pen, the pen she used to sign the grace. <coughs> and she left the pen to her children in memory of such a life-changing event. From uh, 1857 to 1866, Adelaide was traveling together with husband, children, nannies, and actors. And she went all over Europe, Portugal, Russia, England, Greece, and also in Egypt. 
She keeps bringing the name of Italian theater everywhere. And in the meantime, she does a little hidden propaganda for the new country that is coming up. And in the new politics, Camillo Benzo de Cavour, who she admired and loved so much, tried to take advantage of her fame. He, for instance, wrote to her, Se ne serva di questa sua autorità, appro della nostra patria. Ed io applaudirò in lei non solo la prima artista d'Europa, ma il più efficace nostro cooperante nei, nei negozi diplomatici. She was often seen as a symbol of Italian unity, of the new Italia, and of the revolution. And she was acclaimed by young people, students, all over Europe and even in Russia. One of the ways she expressed her feeling toward the new country was by acting roles that symbolized such feelings. In 1859, she was acting at the Teatro San Benedetto in Venice, La Giudita, a drama written just for her by Giacometti. Giacometti was a, a playwright that was usually writing for Adelaide Ristori and <coughs> other great actors. The ideas of liberty and rebellion to the foreign oppression in the play were the same as the fights on the streets of the Italian peninsula. The figure of this woman that risks her life to, serve, uh, to save her own city, Betulia, from the troops of Nabucodonosor was welcomed by the audience with much fervor. Actually, the audience, even if Adelaide was acting something else, was playing something else, was always asking for one specific moment in the Judith. Oh, fratelli, la forte Giuditta, solo un nome, un ricordo vi sia, ne si imprechi alla vedova Pia che col sangue ha serbato l'onore. Caste spose, se il guardo volgete al suo lingue, mio funebre tetto, non piegate la fronte sul petto, non gemete nel tiepido cor, ma il mio nome ai fanciulli insegnate. Sappian essi che santa è la guerra, se lo strano minaccia la terra, che per patria l'eterno ci die. Dio e patria sono uno, Son tutto, per noi figli d'un nome verace, non vi è patria se l'are mendace, vile il popolo che muta la fe. Oh fratelli, una gente infedele non calpesti le sante contrade, Dio vi guarda, vi affila le spade, io giuditta a guidarvi verrò. Or vi lascio, nessuno mi segua, sola riedo allo stello natio, ho compiuta la legge di Dio, dritto alcuno agli omaggi, non ho. Giuseppe Verdi admired her profoundly and wrote La Ristoria, a great actress who just in a few years had the Italian name resonating all around Europe, and Garibaldi, to thank her for her financial support to the Garibaldini, wrote, Dear lady, I know how much you do for our volunteers, and I, in their name, bring all the gratitude that one could have for an Italian like you. You that combine the heart and fame of the artist with the one of the patriot. Mm -hmm. Suo devotissimo Giuseppe Garibaldi. Vorrei poter mandare migliaia di lire al comitato di soccorso, ma con questi chiari di lune non si possono fare che in merci, e io do, offro la mia merce. Money was an issue, and this is why Adelaide Giuliano and the entire family decided to tour the United States of America. L'America mi ha tolto dalle più gravi torture della mia vita. In 1866, she paid the first of four visits to the United States. They left on September 1st, 1866 from Europe and arrived in New York in September 13th, 1866. Nel settembre 1866 traversai per la prima volta l'Atlantico per visitare gli Stati Uniti, ove restai fino al 17 maggio dell'anno seguente. 
Non potevo desiderare più festose accoglienze a quelle avute. Thanks to the American producer, Mr. Grant, the newspaper had already talked about the great, great diva arriving to New York. So when she arrived, there was a big crowd waiting for her and they walked with her to the fantastic hotel, <coughs> the Fifth Avenue Hotel, that was her residency. And it was the most luxurious hotel in town. Non si parla che di milioni di dollari. A sentire tutte queste ricchezze mi pare di sognare. Dicono che farò molti denari. Ero impaziente di calcare quelle terre vergini e far risuonare il sì, io per prima, in quella terra nobile, patria di Washington, dove sapeva che nella febbre degli affari e la corsa vertiginosa verso la fortuna, la scienza e l'arte non erano dimenticate. Durante il mio soggiorno a New York ebbi un successo costante. Da quell'epoca datano relazioni d'amicizia che né tempo né nella lontananza hanno intiepidite. Scrivendo queste linee, mando un affettuoso saluto a quelli che conservano di me un ricordo costante al di là dell'oceano. Grazie agli americani! Her first show was at the Lyceum Theatre, September 20th, Medea. The contract guarantee a number of shows, no less than 120, in a period of between 25 and 31 weeks, in New York, Boston, uh, Philadelphia, and La Havana, Cuba. The box office was to be divided 50-50 if they, arri they were arriving up to $1,500. After $1,500, 60% was going to the company and 40% was going to the producer. There was the problem of adapt adapting the plays because they needed to be shorter. And in fact, why? Because the transportation in New York stopped at 10.30 p.m. So they needed to be shorter. But uh, the cuts were not of the scene where the light was playing. All the cuts were on the scenes mm -hmm. of the other actors. Also because of money, uh, you know, the company couldn't afford great actors, so, so they were carrying the scenes of the modest actors that were in the company. Here in New York, she won much applause with the Elizabeth, Elizabeth, an Italian study of the English Queen, written for her by Paolo Giacometti, the playwright from before. Questo lavoro per essere pieno di effetti scenici, ebbe il più grande successo. La parte di Elisabetta mi riusciva più difficile di ogni altra, poiché in questo personaggio non parlava che l'arte. Moltissime furono le città da me visitate in America. Fu un complesso di risultati superiori alle mie aspettative. Posso dire che ho percorso, palmo a palmo, tutti gli Stati Uniti. Ne partì del maggio del 1867 per ritornarmi nel settembre dello stesso anno. On May um, 9th, 1874, the company started the first worldwide tour. First stop, Rio de Janeiro. But before that, Lisbona, Pernambuco, and Bahia. Then Mexico, Cuba, New York again, where she missed some of the costumes, but she, then she got them again. And then California. And everything was done with this wagon that was her house. It was a really a train car, but was her house, was furnished. Um, the, then, so after 20 days in San Francisco, the company went to Australia, where there was great success. But to go to Australia, they stopped first in the Hawaii. And then at the end, and the tour ended after two years in Brindisi. On July 3rd, 1882, she performed in English again at the Drury Lane Theater, the entire drama of Lady Macbeth. And these are just some of her costumes. The last farewell to the theater happened in New York, where she was uh, 
doing a Ken Macbeth, starring together with Edwin Booth. He was his uh, partner on stage. Edwin Booth was the king of Shakespeare, was the prince of Hamlet, and also was the brother of another Booth <laughs> that killed Lincoln. Yeah. In 1885, she retired and she devoted herself to her memoir, Ricordi e Studi Artistici. And on January 29, 1902, basically when the day of her 80th birthday, she received the homage of Vittorio Emanuele III, the king of Italy, in a Roman house in Via Monterone 76, an honor never never served before to an artist. She died in the same house in Rome in October 9th, 1906, and was buried in the chapel of the Capranica family al, um, al Cimitero Monumentale del Verano in Roma. Let me see this, let me do this, let me go. Uh, and now we go to Alessandra Vannucci, who is going to tell us more instead of the correspondence between um, uh, uh, the Lideri story and um, the emperor of, the last emperor of uh, Brazil. Now, now I remember what I have to tell you. So. What we want to do, and then I'll, I'll ask Alessandra to join me. What um, this idea is really to, you've seen how much she traveled, which is something that is very, it, it's something that to me is, is really incredible, um, especially because it's 1800. I am tired just traveling by plane. So I don't, I, I don't know how she did it. She had that beautiful house, let's say, to travel, but still. Um, and so my idea, um, working on this for, you know, to bring it to schools and universities, to have Adelaide known everywhere, also because she was the first diva. We had the first diva. Um, is to do like one presentation only on America. It's a fantastic, and Alessandra is going to show you some parts that where there was an actor who traveled with her, and he wrote a book, uh, Adelaide Restore in the United States and Cuba. Then there is an entire section for South America. There is another entire section for Australia. And not just to one of the photos that you have seen in, this, the, in, the, in the presentation, I found it because the Italian Cultural Institute in Copenhagen did a presentation of the Leider story in Denmark. So it's really, you can do so much. And again, you'll see in a moment uh, with Alessandra, there is a beautiful, uh, if you go to Genoa, uh, the, the um, Libreria Museo dell'Attore, Biblioteca Museo dell'Attore, which is a place where they have the entire archive of the Ladera Store. Because what she did, she was not only the first diva, she was also the first archival celebrity. She really kept everything. There are diaries, there are, she was translating all the script into, you know, to, to, in the language where she was acting, of the country where she was acting, to sell it but also to have it. So there is so much, and it's so interesting, not only because, you know, we, I'm, as an actress, I like, yeah. but it's also it's like, I feel like, you know, we are not alone in doing theater, Italian theaters, because I started to do Italian theater here because I wanted to show how beautiful Italian theater is. And so, you know, and there is so much, and also to discover, there is one thing that um, I, it was in my presentation and I cut it. She discovered the matinee in America. She said, oh, this is the matinee, is an interesting concept because it allows 
women and young women to go in different, on different times during the day. And it's a different crowd, but these Americans, they made the matinee, which is interesting. So it's, there is so much to discover, and I, uh, this is what I, in the, fu in the near future, want to do. So now let me ask Alessandra to come. Please, Alessandra Vannucci from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. These two books have been written by her. This is the Brazilian um, version, uh, edition, and that is the Italian edition that just started, uh, I mean, um, was published last year. Last 22. year, yeah. In the, so, in the century of the, of the birth. Yeah, because yeah, last year was the two hundred. Uh, there was this the two hundredth anniversary, and uh, and so and it's the same, right? Is no. like no, okay. A little bit changed, and uh, and uh, and the big difference is that I have some of the of the of those here. If someone is interested, after I can show. But uh, but uh, this is an Italian, and this yes. is a. So what is the difference between the two besides the Brazilian, uh, uh, the Portuguese? Well, this uh, the introduction has been rewritten re because uh, last year there was some so many occasions of uh, research about restoring for for the double centenary, the second centenary, and then I had to rewrite. And the difference as well is this: this book make me no louder. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is a big and, difference. Uh, and I have now the privilege to I've asked it to her to read some mm, little. Uh, part of my talk, and then she will do. Uh, uh, she will give her voice to a lot of characters, uh, but especially to the two that are the protagonists of this story: Adelaide and Don and, Pedro. And Don Pedro is here. And then the uh, on on June 28, uh, 1869, at the Teatro Lirico Fluminense in Rio de Janeiro. Not a single applause, not a murmur greeted Medea's entrance on stage in a spectacular black mantle. In a tomb-like silence, Ristori was astonished, for the Latin American audience's reputation for kindness is well known. Then she moved slowly uh, and broke the silence with a display of a voice capable of such compositional dominance that Giuseppe Verdi himself, as you heard before, considered it exemplary and even fitting to opera stage. The state of the stall immediately afterwards was that of a very table fancy. Some spectators were shocked. Some compared the effect of Ristori entrance to that of a living Greek statue. They said, the muse is not dead. Here she comes, is she returning to earth? That night, which was the Latin American debut for the actress, when the curtain fell, she was crowned by one, uno di quegli applausi che battezzano un grande successo. As she herself wrote in her memoirs, artists and students invaded the stage to kneel at her feet and adore her in front of a delirious audience and the imperial family standing ovation. The company reported taking a month about 15,000 francs, about 10 times the average for the same program in Italy for one night. It was much money. Tribute to the genius did not stop any longer. Every evening, the actress was welcomed into the theater by the band with fireworks, flares, flags, and flight of birds. At the end of each performance, someone offered her, kneeling naturally, poems and flowers. On the evening of the Beneficiata, which is a charity night, a child decorated with the Italian flag brought her a tiara offered by the Italo-Brazilian colony. And she was, at that time, presented a declared incomparable queen of the tragic and dramatic stage. The emperor, who was seated in his grandstand, in his box, welcomed the epithet for the actress without embarrassment and agreed to introduce the book in her honor with a test signed Don Pedro de Alcantara, without uh, nobility. Uh, let, me to, let me introduce you, as he wrote, a phenomenon named Ristori. A phenomenon, not just a woman. Here you will understand why she roams the state of Europe and the whole world as if a queen pays visit to her territories. 
The same simple signature concluded the letter in, uh, in Italian that Ristori saw herself delivered a few weeks later when she was in Buenos Aires, whose author, Don Pedro, is willing himself su attaccatissimo, you can see it here, in other times he signed himself delay attaccatissimo, which is most affectionately yours, but it's a kind of strange Italian, uh, confessed to her an acute saudade, which is he was missing her, basically, and reminded of her promise to return to court soon. And surprisingly, months later, the actress confided that she felt. Un grande spiacere a dire addio ad una terra con anime tanto poetiche e generose ed una famiglia regnante quale non si rinviene una simile in Europa. Ristori high rankings friendship were a rare exception. Uh, but it was no exception, as we've seen with Laura before, her condition of an actress or actor traveling non-stop around the world. In the aftermath of, of the Italian unification, uh, 1860, Mattatori e Prime Donne, or actor and actress, very famous, launched themselves in exhausting tours, carrying in their trunks costume scripts, scandals, as well as an idea of the new Italy. Rich in traditions, but now reborn, endowed with an exceptional artistic genius. It was a patriotic mission, as we heard, beyond the roles that they played on stage. But this was just the wind that swelled the, the, the tricolor. It existed as well, secret, concrete needs and necessities and motivations. The South American route, with the exponential growth of emigration, uh, of course, predisposed favorab favorable audience for linguistic reasons. Thus, what happened is that each year at the end of May, after the theaters in the peninsula had closed, and when weather conditions in the southern hemisphere, South America, seemed less threatening, several Italian companies were leaving to South America to be back in October. An astonishing transoceanic commuting, which replicated on the international scale the very competitive condition of the domestic market. And who? Who opened the runway, excelling during a half a century on stages all over the world? Was there, Adelaide Ristori. But anyway, she remained quite an exception, being titled the queen of the stage by none other than the last emperor of Brazil. In Ristori's social ascension, the projection we see offered by the marriage with Marquise Giuliano Capranica had not been irrelevant. The nobility status, while exceptional for a figlia d'arte as she was, was managed with low profile. She could rely on personal friendship with Emperor Napoleon III, the kings of Bavaria and Scandinavia, Isabella, the queens of Spain, the Savoy, and Don Pedro, to whom she preferred to ask not privileges, but mercies, as we've seen, for sentences to death. Here, for example, uh, and ask for a mercy to Don Pedro. A restored public role, that of a wife and a mother who had not given up of her identity as an artist, represented the shining example of a woman's and class emancipation. Not just a woman emancipation, an artistic class emancipation as well. Instrumental in modifying the social perception of what should be an actress craft. Uh, in so doing, she contributed to the formation of Italian national identity while being at home at the Brazilian court. Why? Because Don Pedro designed for his country an American future that is non-colonial, but still anchored to European and Catholic values. He prized the contribution of immigrants, such as of traveling artists. Uploading from uh, his box, The Queen of the Stage, then Don Pedro nourished this project for, of a cultivated and modern Brazil, open to the world and found of arts. Not coincidentally, among the heroines devoted to patriotic mission, whom Ristori loved to play, she preferred big women's queens, uh, that, uh, in, in, in which sumptuous robes and solemn poses she had herself portrayed in photographies that she gave to admirers. The emperor himself, which was very fond of photography, and he was the first photographer in Latin America, uh, jealously preserved some of them for many, many years. Some I such images fixed in the, in the collective imagination a statue as a grand tragedienne, 
the same as Raquel, who was a correspondent, in fact, while at the same time laying at the foundation for promotional marketing that included the sale of Cologne candies and eyebrows cosmetics a la ristori. In this mirror effect among the marquis and their queens, nobility of soul and titled nobility, restorative status was further elevated much more so that no competition with other actresses, however famous, seemed any longer possible. It took place the idea that the unique comparison to illustrate Ristori's acting was lyric singing. That's why we call her a diva. And she was really a diva, a muse, perceiving that the opera was the legacy of the tragic spirit of the, the, the Greek tragedy. The fact that Ristori's genius was generated in Italy was also influencing at that time, as Italy was considered the, the quintessential land of earth and the Italian were considered one of the most effective instrument of human expression, was the language. It, was, as it, was, was. As the emperor <laughs> wrote in his introduction, then it was quite you know, well known. And uh, can I, can I, I, know, I know that I'm stopping you one second, but no, no, sorry. No. Just want to tell you that these photos, you see these costumes, there was a beautiful exhibition uh, at, uh, in Genoa, and she had some of the costumes were only for photos because she was giving the photos away. And then there was a replica of the costume for the scene, for the stage that was more comfortable and less beautiful. But... This and she worked with, with, a, with an image market and an, 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 an idea of style through the photographs. And it was in Italian, of course, then, that he chose, he chose Don Pedro, chose to write here. Since the beginning of a dance correspondence that would last a lifetime, with a very few meetings combined months in advance at the confluence of convoluted journeys of the two, the correspondence sealed the intimacy. They wrote about literature, common acquaintances, places, but also of plays, acting styles, and the latest repertoire with a curious reversal of roles. Don Pedro opines on the shows he attends while does not expound on politics. Instead, Ristori punctually updates the political debate, dropping any remarks about competing artists, except in cases where she recommends some young actresses to the emperor, one being Eleonora Duse. Don Pedro's theatrical passion was also, I said already, a public policy. Theater took on the role of an educational tool, and the theater whole explicitly represented the nation, welcoming and ordered according to a precise social ambitions. Therefore, the emperor presided over each performance by having its presence announced on the playbill and cared that the content corroborate his idea of a nation. Moreover, thanks to his marriage to the Neapolitan Teresa Cristina di Borbone, Don Pedro loved bel canto because she was singing, she was using to, to sing in Neapolitan, her, his wife, and that concretely helped stimulate melomania at court. He founded the conservatory and financed the opera season with the topic that uh, Beside the cherished public and national pride, it is good habit that require government support for Italian companies. Ah. And he had a special stage built, the Teatro Lirico Fluminense, endowed with this extraordinary acoustic. On that stage, Ristori performed in her first and the second season in Rio in 74. Then the first was 69, the second one was 74. So, before she was able to return, in October, you remember that she was, she was uh, announcing a return since the last travel, but she couldn't return. Before she was able, in October 71, Don Pedro visited Italy with a classic grand tour, stops that he did not consider accomplished what, without suffering. Una, almeno, delle di lei rappresentazioni. You see that it describes all the itinerary. And it's really the grand tour uh, in, the, in his classical stops. Then he describes all the itinerary and he says, but I won't go away before I can, I am able to see one of your, of your representations. Alas, his story was in Odessa, in a very complicated situation. She could not come back. She promised him a private performance for the end of the year in Paris. Two years later, his story announced a new visit to Rio, where she planned to inaugurate a long trip called, we already known, the 
uh, round the world tour. The news aroused the enthusiasm of the emperor, who lavished advice on repertoire. Credo che Shakespeare sarebbe, riuscirebbe moltissimo, almeno come novità per la maggioranza. Non parlo di me, perché ella sa benissimo come sono appassionato dei capolavori di quel genio e che non mi dimenticherò già mai la scena di Lady Macbeth. And here we have the scene of Lady Macbeth that we already seen this evening. Uh, in fact, the, the sleepwalking scene restores centerpiece since 1857, as we know from Laura before, had been part of the private performance in Paris, which Don Pedro describes as... Quella sera che già mai dimenticherò. <laughs> and she was just acting, of course. Uh, yeah, it just that. It was a private acting, yeah. acting, nothing else. He would not miss. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here. He would miss. He would not miss any. Uh, he would not miss a single performance out of the 12 dates the following year staged by Ristori in Rio. The world tour had been financed by two mortgages of family assets, and armored by aggressive pre-production in an attempt to keep out the best theaters, the far more affordable competition of great actor Tommaso Salvini, whose posters anyway plastered the city while her story was on stage. And this, I think, is, was quite irritating for her. Teatro sempre stracolmo. Exalted, young actor Marco Piazza. L'imperatore con la corte al completo non ha perso una recita e ieri per la beneficiata della Ristori le ha donato una croce tempestata di brillanti. The day before, crossing the young actor Marco Piazza at the Jardin Botanico in Rio Janeiro, the gentle emperor had managed to extort from him the title chosen by Ristori for the beneficiata, and, we, and which she, that was superstitious, would not reveal even to the emperor himself. It was Maria Antonietta, of course. A show for which Ristori changed 14 costumes, especially soon for her by Charles Worth, the Parisian tailor of the Queens, a very famous uh, tailor. They are new, they are the usual gallery of heroines, which was Elizabeth of England, Medea, Maria Stuarda, Renata di Francia, featured only one new title, Lucrezia Borgia by Victor Hugo, compared to the 69 playbill. But the risk of losing the podium of Queen was averted by the grandeur of the staging. Qui restano stupefatti di veder montare in poche ore spettacoli così grandiosi. Commented General Galletti, who accompanied the company. It was like 80 people uh, with the story, with the company story at that time. Reviews shows that it was rather Salvini who thrilled the audience with his realist interpretation of Hamlet and Otello, which he endowed with an emotional power previously unknown on Brazilian stages. After Brazil, Salvini went on New York and London, where he was crowned the first tragedian of our time. Uh, at the head of all his contemporaries, outstanding Ristori. Uh, what happens here, uh, some costumes about Ristori we already seen, but look at what the standards publish. In the pathetic, Salvini is unmatched, Ristori does not equal him. It was not Ristori, but Giacinta Pizzano staged Hamlet in Travesti. That was the suggestion of Don Pedro, do you remember? Uh, what the Marchesa Noblesse oblige could not have afforded to do. In the two decades to the end of the century, the competition among Italian actors to share Latin American market became ruthless. Falling into the hands of international agents who speculated on contracts no longer granting margin of excellence. Uh, on the contrary, intentionally provoking confrontation on the same titles and stages to lower prices, such was the case of Eleonora Duse with Sara Bernard. Ristori never returned. Instead, she kept writing very long letters in which, assuming the diplomatic role that even Italian minister Cavour, as we, as we saw before, had recognized, she described the different forms of modernities in the cities she visited during the war tour in 75, in Russia in 77, in Scandinavia in 80, and in the United States in 82, especially uh, careful to the Universal ex Exhibition Exposition, which interested Don Pedro for the intention that he had to create one in Rio. Uh, she understood Don Pedro's curiosity not as an escape from the commitments of monarch, but as una prova del desiderio che anche il suo paese possa approfittare di tutti i risultati ottenuti dal progresso della, della civiltà. 
I didn't translate and I will translate now, the proof of his desire that even Brazil can take advantage of progress as achievement. For his part, Dom Pedro counted on her to expand his knowledge, not only in Italy and artistic circles, but also in European circles of political influences. And he would not hesitate to travel long distances so as not to miss one of her performance. Uh, in 1876, uh, excuse me, as he was leaving uh, from Rio to New York, he promised to see her the following year in Rome. Then one year before he was, he was dating her, confiding. Di goder della di lei amabilissima compagnia e che la mi farà conoscere la società la più interessante di Roma nella serata promessa. After visiting the Middle East and Egypt, he arrived in Rome by train from Naples on the night of February 12th. 1877. The late hour did not prevent him from joining Ristoria, the ball given by Queen Margherita for 10 o'clock at Quirinale. He thus had the opportunity to meet King Vittorio Emanuele II and overcome the embarrassment of not being accompanied by his wife, Teresa Cristina, you remember, Borbone, who remained at the hotel because she blamed the Savoy for the expulsion of the Bourbons from the Kingdom of Naples. A few days later, the Empress left the room at the Bristol Palace to avoid meeting the king, the Italian king, in a private audience with Don Pedro. The following Monday, there was a reception in honor of the emperor at the empress at Palazzo Capranica, to which the Roman aristocracy showed up massively. There was 350 people. Uh, Rome, Florence, and Paris are the cities that mark the stage uh, of an intimacy uh, consolidated by social and private encounters whose interruption causes Don Pedro, while embarking back to Rio, uh, to express a sadness from which it exudes, as, as by me, the most sincere affection. Prima di lasciare l'Europa, bisogno di farle il mio addio. Un'altra gita sua nel mio paese sarebbe quasi impossibile, ed io so che avrò moltissimo da fare in questi prossimi anni. Questo mondo è troppo vasto per gli amici. They did not see each other for several years. From Don Pedro's letters, alongside nostalgic appreciation of Ristori's triumphs followed in the newspapers, it emerges an impulse to escape the burden of power and return to quel tempo dove ho trovato tanti amici ed il mio spirito era libero da tanta preoccupazione. Deploring the downfall of the cultural movement in Rio, even though he was aware that it was due in part to to precisely to his absence uh, from the Imperial Tribune, Don Pedro, Don Pedro pleaded with Restori to include this country, please, in his next tour. Sorry. Il, Brasile. Il Brasile non rivedrà mai più una buona compagnia drammatica italiana. The excitement of the theaters did not arouse the same enthusiasm or, uh, once the project of an enlightened nation vanished. All that was left on stage for him was a vain display of etiquette. La vita artistica qui è quasi sparita e non penso adesso che nella villeggiatura di Petropolis, che tanto mi rammarica di non essere conosciuto da lei. Credo che le piacerebbe una passeggiata nel mio paese senza gli imbarazzi teatrali. The decadence of the theaters became for him a symptom of personal failure, marked by isolation in the mountains of Petropolis and in complete contrast to the mundane management of the Savoy monarchy he had known through Ristori in Rome, with tanti uomini di Stato, rimarchevoli della scuola dell'illustre Cavour, riuniti intorno ad un re che segue l'esempio del suo eroico padre. He perceived the, uh, the unstoppable disarticulation of his apparatus of influence as an epochal change he foreshadows in the personal sphere. La politica occupa uh, lo spirito quasi dappertutto e niente più difficile che essere monarca deve rendersi conto di tutto e infine la giustizia arriva sovente troppo tardi studio gli affari nel suo paese e credo che il re fa bene di far poco a time of noble sentiments and personalities considered heroic which Restori had sublimated on stage was, was fighting away Don Pedro remained attached to that world uh, of which he had been an advocate and which was crumbling, and sought in his correspondence with Ristori the evidence that would reverse his version of history. Una vera amicizia supplisce nella memoria ciò che le parole non possono esprimere. Rivedo la galleria delle fotografie e mantengo la viva speranza di giungere alla presenza tutti questi incalcellabili ricordi. 
This disillusioned gaze turned to the past lends emblematic values to the portraits that Don Predo now increasingly, almost obsessively and very frequently requested about. They, the photographs, are emblems of permanence, of feeling and tangible, albeit ghostly, documents of a life that really happened to offset the feelings of evanescence also induced by aging. The two were aging, but especially by the perception that not only he, not only she and her family, but the whole world was aged. There is an illusion encapsulated in objects, images, and feelings of a century going up in smoke, in this case, the time of kings and queens. While Ristoli knows how to share with Don Pedro her fragility in the face of advancing age, and her husband Giuliano, and her own increasingly frequent health problems, at the same time, however, she is rigid in the undaunted expression of her conservative and monarchist fate, both in the political and artistic field, when Don Pedro would never, never, never question her role as a queen, of course. Differently, Ristorelli finds herself more realistic than the emperor and reproaches him in 1888 when he gave up at the last minute to visit Rome despite announcing himself by telegram, this telegram, and transiting by train from Florence to Naples. What happened? At the very last minute, he did not get off the train. Avoided taking sides in the divergence between monarchy and papacy, which would have fomented criticism in Catholic Brazil. Che peccato che Roma sia stata privata dell'onore e della soddisfazione di possedere la maestà vostra fra le sue mura. Onore che da ognuno si teneva certo. Non posso nascondere alla maestà vostra che il fatto ha prodotto in tutti una penosa impressione. Una penosa impressione. The third trip of the emperor to Europe spanned two years, leaving the country in regency to Princess Isabella at the crucial stage of the abolitionist battle in 1888, which Don Pedro does not mention at all in his letters. In May 88, his precarious health deteriorated and he received the last rites in the imperial suite of the Grand Hotel e de Milan a Milano. In those very days, the regent promulgated the free belly law in Brazil, by which the country, the last of all the American ex-colonies, abolished slavery, 13 of May of 88. The emperor was informed nine days later. Uh, the following year, while Ristori slugged with bronchite, rheumatism, and her husband's paralysis, Don Pedro faced two terrible blows. The Republican coup, which forced him to leave the country in 48 hours, renouncing all possessions, including his, his personal archives and a lot of photographies as well, and the sudden death of the Empress a month uh, after uh, in Porto. Uh, widowhood sharpened the loneliness. On the other hand, it allowed the friendship for his story to expand into a different feeling. The love that until then Don Pedro called saudade touched more passionate chords. Se io scrivesse tutto ciò che un'amicizia di quasi 40 anni mi ispirerebbe, non riuscirebbe come nella prima occhiata che tanto ardentemente desidera il di lei attaccatissimo Don Pedro. You know, the word attaccatissimo means another thing a little bit, much more intimate. True, true, is it true that the emperor in his last years dedicated no different romantic expression to other women with whom he had bonded in the past and whom in this final arrangement of life he was delighted to treat as constant friends. But from the gallant temerity of Don Pedro, uh, last letter, it also exiles a very human fear before the imminent end. Carissima signora, he writes to her friend on September 9, 1891, from Vichy. Conoscendola di lei, affezione per me, temo il suo silenzio, ma spero di ingannarmi. Come tutto ha cangiato, ma mi sono ancora dei fidi e lo studio è la grande mia consolazione. In the evening, he records in, in his diary, Cenato bene, nessuna lettera da conoscenti. Sette e mezzo, scritto alla Ristori. Voglio che desti tutte le vecchie amicizie. And this is the emperor. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Alessandra. So, Thank you, Laura. Thank you. 
Uh, I wanna, uh, do you have a question? So we can do a, a, a very, um, a Q&A &A if you have questions, comments, if you wanna know more about Adelaide Ristore, or is enough? No. no, there's no recording of her voice. This is a true pity because uh, many composers, and the most famous is Giuseppe Verdi, was describing her voice as capable to, to, to um, as, as, as the voice of Carlos, we say that is capable to... to a, b a big range, uh, yes. A big range. Then she was, uh, Verdi uh, says that she was capable of verticalizing from uh, uh, contralto to soprano. Alto, and that she was using this acting. Then it, uh, we can imagine that her acting. There were no mics at the time in theater. Yeah, no mic. And their acting was quite singing, was very yeah. climax. And also, one of the things that because she was acting in Italian in different countries, not only the voice was very powerful, but also the gestures. Everything that you've seen, can you go back to some of the, yes. so the poses that she was using, and she was looking at the poses in, by looking at pe uh, paintings or, uh, you know, uh, monuments. It was really, uh, all the poses, is, it was really big and important because you had to communicate some emotions through something that was not the language in many, many cases. Yeah, and actually, sorry, it, it's the, when if you read uh, what she says about Eleonora Duse, that was a mentee for, for her. So she liked Eleonora Duse, she helped her, but she couldn't understand the way she was acting. Oh. It was like, no, this is this new thing is like, you, she was saying that you cannot hear her so much. Of course, and Eleonora Duse invented the, the naturalistic way of acting. Then she was inside, uh, and she was like an actress that Stanislavski loved so much because she was uh, acting life f for film, film acting. And the story was acting for four thousand people. Then she had to do big gestures yeah. and to in big in big theaters. There was I saw yes. Uh, from what you can gather among all the critics or listeners over this period of time, uh, which role would you say is probably the one she's most renowned for, that she made the greatest impact on audiences? Uh, it's a tough question, but I, it seems like quite a range, but uh, I just would be interested if there's one that all I, the critics agree upon. The, I think the most, the most important was Lady Macbeth. Yes, our common friend, uh, Antonella Valoroso, who edited uh, uh, newly the, the memoirs of Ristori, uh, was presenting in the Congress uh, three months ago. They did a conference, a four days conference on um, uh, Adelaide Ristori, is available on YouTube. A study on the effort of Ristori to learn English in order to do Lady Macbeth in English. And he, he succeeded, and uh, uh, unless it was difficult to her to learn English, she was speaking perfect French, but she, she, was, she had a difficulty to learn English, and she succeeded. And then she passed uh, uh, to the first moment, as Laura said, she was doing just a shortened version with just the, the Lady Macbeth with, as protagonist. And then after, with Booth, she succeeded in doing in English in New York and in London the entire tragedy. Uh, with with this role, which was, I think, yeah, the most famous she, uh, yeah. she was acting. I yeah. think, I think, uh, yeah, Lady Mac. But it seems from what you read, uh, it was the most famous. Then there was, uh, I think, um, she liked Maria Antonietta a lot because yeah. of these fourteen costumes. You know, women <laughs> like to get <laughs> to get changing. Yeah, and and also I think um, um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, of course. Yeah. I think she. It, it's interesting that she was a quite 
a previous stage director because she was doing all the setting of the costumes. She was uh, speaking to the autos as well to the to the scenographers and the constructors, the builders. Then in a time that there was no not no, no, it didn't exist a, a, a stage director as Laura or uh, myself we are. Uh, Ristori was clearly the aesthetic uh, the aesthetic yeah, responsible because for at the time it was like the artistic director was also the actor it was also the director and yeah. then in the 50s we start to have as you know because i say it all the time so they know is this, with streller we really have the yeah. figure of a director in italy but before it was like like i did i had the, the experience of working many of you know with mario caratenuto who was an a, a, actor artistic director and director but he was on stage it was never directing you but he was deciding everything. We did the Goldoni, but he decided to put it in Rome because it was very Roman. So yes, it was. We call, we call it capocomico, and yes. it is a very important word for Italian theater. And uh, but I think Charlie case, Chaplin was the same. Yeah, I of think course. you know yeah. many actors here were the was, same. There was not a director. Co the company. In this case, I think that uh, not not me, but uh, some researcher like Antonella, for example, uh, in, uh, enchants and valorizes a lot the role of his husband because uh, Giuliano not only uh, gave um, values to her, understanding that she could be the one that was earning money in a broken family. You know, a broken also, the family of Giuliano understood uh, yeah. that. Not just this, but he invented for her a, a cosmic fama, a cosmic fame. Like, uh, Ristori was really famous all over the world in a time with no social media, no television, no them. And he was the one that built this idea of a diva with all this market of uh, gadgets, gadget market. Then she was not just a great actress, she was a model of, of, of um, styling. and marketing, uh, yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, that's it. Uh, do you want to add anything out. else? Um, uh, I just uh, I want to add that the, the relationship also between her husband and Adelaide was unique because they really loved each other and they really form a couple in that was, I think they were paired. There was not there was no one more important than the other. They were really partners in crime. And they had, uh, what are we doing? Okay. Uh, no, uh, Juliana Juliana is fair. So they were very, really husband and wife, and also the children, they were always traveling together. So this idea of family that she had, there was, it was uh, you know, Rachel was, famous for having a lot of uh, um, lovers. And even, the, I think, the uh, sister-in-law of Adelaide was the lover of the king, Vittorio Emanuele. Yeah. So, you know, around her, there was a lot of stories and gossipy and things going on. But she was, even as a diva, where you had, as we sh saw, many people admire you, loving you. She was really... a, a, a a person, a, diciamo, tutto un pezzo, di tutto un pezzo, we will say in, in Italian. She was tough, so, really. Yeah, she was a, really a strong. Yeah. I wanted to say a, a, a funny thing. Have you noticed, it? well, I've noticed it, uh, studying Ristori photographs especially and, and seeing the costumes, because these photos we took in the, in the yeah. exhibition. The, this was an <laughs> exhibition in Genoa. In Genoa, the, the costumes shows a very thin person and the photograph shows a quite <laughs> biggest woman. Then I ask it, what is that? Because sometimes it, 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 it is a case of photography really, which <laughs> enlarges the physics and bodies. And the, and the creator, uh, so the mic, because they need the, the, which is an expert of, of, of fashion, and uh, she said, no, that's for explaining what she was saying is very interesting, that Ristori began archives. She's an inventor of archiving herself. Before archiving the costumes, she made the il, il sarto, come si dice, the, the tailor, the tailor, the tailor. Uh, reduced to the original uh, scale when she was 18. <laughs> that is a great idea, actually. So you leave the costume that are like yeah. three sizes. Uh, 
Mm. Take a note. Then she was a very, a very tough person, but she was not. She was a woman. Then she was not yeah. like vanity. And yeah. And uh, unfortunately, all these things are at the uh, uh, Museo Biblioteca dell'Attore, which is this. Is is quite small for everything they have. They have uh, the entire archival of Tommaso Salvini, which was very, very famous here in this United States. Um, Ernesto Rossi, they have so much, and it's a very tiny place for yep. what everything they have. If you go there, I went there with a friend who is, was part of making uh, this uh, library, the, having this library open. So I saw also the behind the, the, the scene. They have like a space like this, long like this and like this, I mean, not two spaces or three spaces, like this stage, full, only full of uh, the, mat the documents. Then there are I boxes and boxes and boxes of props of jewelry that I saw. I couldn't wear it, but I was like, oh, I wanna. Shoes. Yeah. Costumes, it's incredible. Unfortunately, the costume, you cannot see them. There, there was this exhibition, but usually they're not. They are, no, they are in cons in, convers in conservation. Excuse me. Yeah, so they, they, you cannot see them. That's a but it's there. really it, it's it's incredible how it, it, there are so many. You know, one of the things that we always I always complain is that there, there is a lack of um, material for actors, directors. It's very difficult to find a lot of stuff because they, they get lost. They don't, they don't think about keeping them. She kept everything. Yeah. And it's, it's like a history there. Train, train tickets. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> everything, everything, everything. So okay, I think, so if you, if you, yes. there's a question there? There is another question, yeah. yes. Do we, do we know where her like, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, her grandchildren, great-grandchildren, are they? Ah, yes, yeah. yes. There's an old family, uh, which part of the family donated the archive. A later part of the archive was staying with, with the family. For example, I've seen a Palazzo Capranica, and this they didn't donate, of course. E un ventaglio, how do you call Like, huh? fan. A fan with 26 signature of kings and emperors. Then some things <laughs> they, they they kept. Yeah, and and when I was at the library at the museum library, it was um, they were telling me how they wh why everything is in Genoa. So the, one of the great grandchildren at the Palazzo Capranica, that is the one in Via Monterone seventy six, if you go, is still there. Um, it, she had someone in the theater business for dinner. And she said, I want to show you something. And she opened this door, and there was a huge room, a salon. And, the, and the, she opened, and there was all this costume and everything. So he called Squarzina, no, Scaparro, Scaparro. Scaparro who just died, a director, very famous director, mm -hmm. who at that time was working in Genoa. Mm -hmm. And he called. So Scaparro went to see everything. I was like, wow. So he called Genoa and said, do you want to take all these archives and everything? And they said yes. And this is why the entire archive that it supposedly, I mean, it was in Rome because she, she was there, went to Genoa. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It is a very beautiful archive that I suggest to visit. It's uh, yeah, if you go very to Genova, ask me, I'll tell you. Museo where Biblioteca to go. Tour. And they were the, the co co editors because I really needed the, the help. Every one of us that study history needs the help of the archivist. They are fantastic of this book and the and the previous as well, uh, which I made with the Biblioteca Nacional in uh, Rio de Janeiro, which is the biggest one and richest book. But this uh, 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 I, I like it especially because because we really re rebuilt like all the photographic uh, references and uh, the co-editor is Museo Biblioteca dell'Attore in Genoa. And if someone is interested, I have two of them. Okay, so 
and uh, that's it. Uh, we'll we'll do more. You know, we'll invite you when you. because there is the America edition, the Australian edition, so I can go to Australia. The South American edition, so I can go to South America. <laughs> so it is the only, it's only done because I, then I can travel together with Adelaide, of course, and Alice. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And uh, thank you so much. And I'll see you at this point. Beside the, the what we're going to, we have on on the Italian stage, but you you know about it. May first to the 16th, in China is back. We have wonderful shows. Oh, you'll be so happy. I know. And uh, yeah, so get ready because there is to be ready. Thank you. E grazie Alice, grazie ragazzi.